ladies and gentlemen, in this uh, globalized international uh, environment, change is taking place fast. There are positive and promising developments, and there are less positive and even clearly negative developments. It is evident that neither the end of the Cold War in and by itself, nor even less, the 11th of September 2001, were the decisive, decisive turning points in history that they were thought to be. We are still living in the post-Second World War era. The Charter of the United Nations may be derided. There still is no substitute for it as a basis for the, for the existing international order as that order moves slowly and in some confusion towards a new order that has so far been predicted but not yet come true. Threats to the security of nations, of communities, and of individuals come today in a, very, in, in a variety of forms. Some are new, like climate change, pollution, and more frequent natural disasters. Not new, but considerably more menacing are drug and human trafficking, illegal arms trade, and other forms of cross-border criminal activity. Globalization does not only profit Goldman Sachs and Coca-Cola. Other forms of threats to security have been with us for a long time. Hunger, disease, displacement of populations, and violent conflict. All these threats expose millions of people to untold suffering and far too often to death. For example, in the Congo, it is estimated that around 5 million people have been killed only in the last 15 years. The nature of conflict has changed and continues to change. Wars opposing states to one another have not ceased to exist altogether. Mercifully, there are significantly fewer of them. The new generation of conflicts involves state and non-state actors and has, have been given a variety of names. They are called asymmetric warfare, unrestricted warfare, even lawfare, and also new wars. Those who try to address these types of conflict do so in a variety of ways and are also many. National governments try their hand at trying to solve these problems. Regional and international organizations like the European Union, the United Nations, the African Union, national and international NGOs, big and small. International law was concerned in the past primarily if not exclusively, with relations between sovereign states. Concern for security meant, first and foremost, the security of the state. There is now more and more concern for the security of communities, minorities, and individuals within a state or across borders between two or more states. Uh, also, we speak now much more about human security. Against this background, the Middle East has always been a troubled region where progress has been slow, where regression is not uncommon, and where external interference has been frequent. Center stage is again occupied by Iran these last couple of days, and its suspected nuclear weapon program. It is intriguing that facts that have been known for years now suddenly raise the suspicion and the fears. I naturally have absolutely no way of knowing if Iran wishes to get nuclear or not. What I do know is that Iran has been an important country in our part of the world for a long time before the Islamic Revolution and after it. I also know that when the United States invaded Iraq, uh, uh, the United States and Britain invaded Iraq and their, with their allies, they have eliminated 
the biggest enemy of Iran, Saddam Hussein. But the coalition did better for Iran. They helped Iran's closest friends take almost total control of Iraq. As a result, Iran today commands infinitely more influence in Baghdad than the United States. And consequently, Iran, with or without the bomb, considers that they are the most important country in the entire region and demand to be treated as such. Turkey is the other important country around the Arab world. They have played their cards very well until now, and we, it will be very interesting to follow how Iran and Turkey will cooperate or oppose one another. But it is remarkable and sad that until now, there was no Arab country among the three dominant regional powers, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. The eruption of the Arab Spring and the peaceful and successful manner in which it started in Tunisia and Egypt was a huge surprise, and it was greeted with enthusiasm, both inside the region and elsewhere in the world. Now, almost one year later, the original enthusiasm has greatly cooled off. The momentum generated in Tunisia and Egypt was thought to be irresistible. It proved not to be that irresistible. Indeed, at times, in some of the countries of the so-called Arab Spring, the trend seems to have been reversed. When I spoke uh, publicly on this subject for the first time, it was in uh, February and March, I made the following points. One, all the people in the Arab world aspire to change, and their aspirations are pretty much the same. Two, change is needed in every country. Indeed, it is overdue everywhere. Three, change will not happen at the same time and in the same manner in all Arab countries. Each country has its own specific conditions and will have to fashion its own way to reform. Four, normally each government can and should respond to the aspirations of its people and lead the process for change. Evidently, the governments of Tunisia and Egypt have not responded soon enough, and their respective leaders have paid the price. In Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain, the authorities did not respond positively either. Quite the opposite. In each of the three countries, the negative reaction, the four countries, the, in each of the four countries, the negative reaction of the government led to much bloodshed and to stalled conditions. Fifth, help from outside will be needed and will be welcome everywhere. But help should not be supply-driven. It should be tailored to the needs of each country as defined by the people of that country, not by foreigners. Universities, think tanks, and pundits uh, will undoubtedly have much to discuss and write about in the coming years. In Tunisia first and in Egypt soon afterwards, the movement remained stubbornly peaceful, even in the face of much provocation and repression. The army, and this was terribly important, refused to participate in the repression and was seen as siding with the masses against the governing elite. The aging dictators of Tunisia and Egypt had really no appetite for a prolonged confrontation with their people. And so President Ben Ali of Tunisia made his escape to Saudi Arabia. President Hosni Mubarak resigned in a more dignified manner, but his move came far too late to win him much sympathy from his people. Libya's popular protest soon developed on the contrary into an ugly civil war. Only military intervention by NATO tipped the balance in favor of what uh, the popular movement which had transformed into a rebellion. That military intervention of NATO will be the subject 
of debate and controversy for a long time to come. Also, for the first time, the principle of the so-called responsibility to protect or R2P was officially invoked in the United, in United Nations Security Council resolution. Some in international law experts have serious doubts about the legality of the resolution. Russia, China, India, and Brazil, who are all members of the Security Council, did not oppose the adoption of resolutions 1970 and 1973. Uh, but they now strongly object to the manner in which NATO acted throughout its intervention in, Li in Libya. In fact, I think NATO never received an, a clear mandate from uh, the Security Council to intervene at all. This episode about the, uh, uh, the Security Council revives the uneasiness expressed by a vast majority of countries outside Europe regarding the responsibility to protect. Far too often, it has been invoked as an excuse to serve the interests of those who intervene, not the interests of those who are supposed to be protected. Similar uneasiness is felt towards the manner in which the International Criminal Court is being used. Countries that are not even parties to the Treaty of Rome are far too often using the ICC for their own ends. The open intimacy between the public prosecutor, Mr. Moreno, and the Security Council, and especially and more uh, between him and the most powerful members of the Security Council, politicizes the court and seriously affects its independence and credibility. Thus, the public prosecutor did not take more than three or four days to announce that he had enough evidence to indict Gaddafi, his son, and his chief of intelligence. Obviously, such a haste may have been a useful experience in the particular case of Libya. It does not enhance the credibility of the court, and it does not serve international justice in the long term. Let me here just add that in saying, in criticizing in, criticizing in this manner, uh, the way in which uh, the, the responsibility to protect and the international court is being used, uh, this in no way means that I am defending Qaddafi. I spoke against Qaddafi several times publicly, and I expressed strong public, uh, I, I strong support to the people of Libya uh, for in, in their legitimate aspirations for something better than what they have had uh, with in, in 42 years under Qaddafi. Be that as it may, the Libyan people are already finding out the, that difficult and costly as it has been getting rid of Qaddafi and his clan, it, were, it, will may, it, it, it may well prove to be the easy part of their long march towards a better tomorrow. Forming a government is already a grindingly slow process, and restoring a minimum of stability an even bigger challenge. The army has split in Yemen, but President Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen seems to have enough support and resources to keep the stalemate for a good while longer. In Syria, the impasse seems to be total. President Bashar al-Assad seems to be saying yes to every offer made to him by the internal opposition and by his regional friends. The problem is that he has not kept any of his promises. And in the meantime, his security forces continue to arrest, torture, and kill his own people in their thousands. One additional thought. Tunisia has been a leader again when it organized an impressively successful election. The result of that election were said to have been as surprising as the popular explosion which, starting with the desperate act of that young man, Mohammed Bouzidi, in that faraway small town, triggered a revolution all over the Middle East. The surprise this time 
is that the Islamic party in Tunisia, al Nahda, came well ahead of all other political parties and got almost 42% of the votes and of the seats in the Constitutional, Constitutional Assembly. This is again something that will give political analysts and pundits much to discuss for a long time to come. Nahda in Tunisia faces a very, very big test. With practically all its cadres coming out of jail or back from exile, with no previous experience in government, will they be able to play the leading role popular support entitles them to? Will they know how to compromise with others? Will they, will they know how to compromise with others? But the other political forces in the country are equally going to be put to the test. They did not do well in the election because they lacked unity and discipline. Will they do better during the debate over the Constitution, the constitution and in the government? And finally, many, commenta many commentators in the West expressed great satisfaction that in all the countries where the demonstrations took place, no U.S. or Israeli flags were burned, no slogans hostile to Israel or supporting Palestine were seen or heard. It was also noted that Islamists were nowhere to be seen at the beginning. Christians and Muslims prayed together, and women and men slept under the same tents in Tahrir Square. And on all these issues, Conclusions drawn were premature at the very least. As for the presence of Islam in the Arab Spring, the elections in Tunisia have given a first indication of things to come. The picture will be further clarified with the legislative elections in Morocco and in Egypt later this month. Similar indications will be more and more evident concerning support for Palestinian rights and opposition to Israeli uh, occupation. Ladies and gentlemen, I fear I have gone far, for far too long, and to conclude, I will just say that it, what a privilege it has been to visit uh, this, this city and this region, uh, visiting the war graves and other places uh, uh, today. Coming here tonight has uh, reinforced my belief in the utmost necessity for all of us every, everywhere to work together to reinforce peace. And I wish the very, very best to the Peace Institute in this part of Belgium. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. <laughs>